We had a right for the American people to believe that generations of our citizens would be able to enjoy those pristine landscapes on spoil, but today one-fifth of the lakes in the Adirondacks is sterilized from acid. It's part of the cost of coal that you don't see when you pay your electric bill, but nevertheless we're paying for it. When I flew over the Cumberland two weeks ago, I saw something that if the American people could see it, there would be a revolution in this country. We are cutting down the Appalachian Mountains with these giant machines, these historic landscapes of Daniel Boone and David Crockett Rome that so much of our culture is rooted in. And with these giant machines called drag lines, which are 22 stories high, I flew under one of them in a Piper Cup. They cost a half a billion dollars, and they practically dispense with the need for human labor, which indeed is the point. When my father was fighting strip mining back, back in the 1960s in Appalachia, I remember a conversation I had with him when I was 14 years old, where he said to me, they're not just destroying the environment, they're permanently impoverishing these communities because there's no way that they can regenerate an economy from these barren moonscapes that are left behind. And he said, they're doing it so they can break the unions. And that's exactly what happened when he told me that there were 114,000 unionized mine workers in West Virginia taking coal out of tunnels in the ground. Today, there are fewer than 11,000 miners left in the state almost uh, less than half of them are unionized because the strip industry isn't. And they're taking more coal out of West Virginia than they were in 1968. The only difference is back then, at least some of that money was being left in the communities for salaries and pensions and reinvestment in those communities. Today, it goes straight up to Wall Street to the big banking houses like Morgan, Bank of America, and the corporate headquarters of Mass Coal, people call an arch coal. Um, and, you know, and uh, these companies are, 95% of the coal in West Virginia is owned by out-of-state interests. And they're liquidating the state for cash with, with these giant machines and 2,500 tons of, di of, of ammonium nitrate explosives they detonate in the state every day. It's the power of a Hiroshima bomb once a week. They're blowing the tops off the mountains to get the coal seams to need. Then they take the rock and the debris and the rubble and they dump it into the adjacent, they, they scrape into the adjacent river valley, and they bury the hollows, they flatten the landscapes. They've already cut down 500 of the largest mountains in West Virginia. I mean, it, this is unimaginable. And they, by the time they get done, they buried, according to EPA, 1,200 miles of American rivers and streams. By the time, and within six years, they will have flattened an area the size of Delaware. This is, incidentally, the Appalachians, are the, are the, during the ice age, the Pleistocene ice age, where I lived in Mount Kisco, it was two and a half miles of ice over the place where my house is today, and North America turned into a tundra. And there was no trees left, except in one refugium, which was the Appalachian Mountains. That's where the forest, the only place where the forest survived. And when the ice withdrew 12,000 years ago, all of North America was reseeded from those forests in, in Appalachia. And that's the mother forest for all of North America. And that's why it's the most biologically diverse and abundant forest in North America. And today, you know, these coal companies, Peabody, Massey, and Arch Coal, are doing, are accomplishing what the glaciers couldn't do, which is to flatten the mountain range and destroy these, you know, forests, the only forest that survived the Ice Age. And, you know, um, we, it's all illegal. You cannot, in the United States, take rock and debris and rubble and dump it into a waterway without a Clean Water Act permit. So we sue them. And you can never get a permit to do such a thing. So we sue them in front of a conservative Republican federal judge, Judge Charles Hayden. And Judge Hayden said the same thing I said. He said, it's all illegal. It's been illegal since day one. And he enjoined all mountaintop mining. Two days from when we got that decision, lobbyists for Peabody Coal and Massey Coal met in the back door of the Interior Department with Gail Norton's first deputy chief, Stephen J. Grimes, who was a former lobbyist for Massey Coal and Peabody Coal. And he's now serving a 10 and a half month jail sentence, but too late for the mountaintop because they rewrote one word, the interpretation of one word of the Clean Water Act, the definition of the word fill, to change 30 years of statutory interpretation and to effectively overrule Judge Hayden's decision and make it legal to dump rock, debris, rubble, garbage, any solid material into any waterway in the United States, not just in West Virginia, but here in Pennsylvania, every other state, um, without a Clean Water Act permit. All you need today is a rubber stamp permit from the Corps of Engineers, which in some districts you can get through the mail or over the telephone. And this is what we're dealing with. You know, it's not just 
in the destruction of our environment is the subversion of American democracy. And wherever you see large-scale environmental destruction, you'll also see democracy subverted. And you know the, the big industries and the big you know the, the polluters and their you know, all this this vast PR network that they have have been very adept over the past uh, you know 20 years at, at marginalizing environmentalists as radicals or militants or, or tree huggers or as I heard the other day pagans who worship trees and sacrifice people. <laughs> but, um, there's there's nothing radical about the idea of clean air and clean water for our children. And we're not protecting the environment for the sake of the fishes and the birds. We're protecting it for our own sake because we recognize, as I said, that it, it's our infrastructure. And if you talk to the people on Capitol Hill who are promoting this kind of rollbacks and ask them, and this, I've done a lot of this with these people, I, I say to them, you know, you love our country, you have children, what are you doing? What they invariably say is, well, the time has come in our nation's history where we have to choose now between economic prosperity on the one hand and environmental protection on the other. And that is a false choice. In 100% of the situations, good environmental policy is identical to good economic policy. If we want to measure our economy, and this is how we ought to be measuring it, based upon how it produces jobs and the dignity of jobs over the generations, over the long term, and how it preserves the value of the assets of our community. If, on the other hand, we want to do what they've been urging us to do on Capitol Hill, which is to treat the planet as if it were a business in liquidation, convert our natural resources to cash as quickly as possible, have a few years of pollution-based prosperity, we can generate an instantaneous cash flow and the illusion of a prosperous economy, but our children are going to pay for our joyride, and they're going to pay for it with denuded landscapes and poor health and huge cleanup costs that are going to amplify over time and that they will never be able to pay. Environmental injury is deficit spending. It's a way of loading the cost of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. And one of the things that I've done over the past 25 years as an environmental advocate is to constantly go around and confront this argument that an investment in our environment is a diminishment of our nation's wealth. It doesn't diminish our wealth. It's an investment in infrastructure, the same as investing in telecommunications and road construction. It's an investment we have to make if we're going to ensure the economic vitality of our generation and the next generation. And I want to say this, there's no stronger advocate for free market capitalism than myself. I believe that the free market is the most efficient and democratic way to distribute the goods of the land. And the best thing that could happen to the environment is if we had true free market capitalism in this country. Because the free market promotes efficiency, and efficiency means the elimination of waste. And pollution is waste. And in a true free market, which we do not have in this country, we would properly value our natural resources. And it's the undervaluation of those resources that causes us to use them wastefully. But in a true free market system, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. But what polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. They raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for everybody else. And they do that by escaping the discipline of the free market. You show me a polluter, I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fat cat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his production costs. That's what all pollution is. Corporations are externalizing machines. They're constantly devising ways to get somebody else to pay their cost of production. And if you're in a polluting industry, the easiest way to do that is to shift your cleanup costs to the public and make yourself a billionaire by poisoning the rest of us. When the Southern Company puts mercury out of its stacks in Mississippi and it falls on New York State and poisons our children's brains and makes it so I can't fish in my state anymore, you know, they're stealing something from us. And they're, they're using that stolen value to give themselves a competitive edge in the marketplace. I pay 30 bucks, like I said, for a fishing license every year. The Constitution of the state of New York says the people of the state own the waterways of the state. They're not owned by the governor or the legislature or the fisheries department, and they're certainly not owned by the Southern Company, but the Southern Company owns them now. They privatize that public trust asset. They privatize the commons to give themselves a distorted and unfair advantage in the marketplace, a subsidy. And they privatize the air in my children's lungs because my kids can't breathe it anymore without getting sick. They stole that from them. And they, they privatize 
the waterways, those beautiful lakes of the Adirondacks. And they privatized the public and private timber stands of the Appalachians, which belonged to us and to private owners, but now the Southern Company owns them, and it's their way of lowering their costs of their products so they can artificially distort the price and sell it and beat the efficient and honest producers in the marketplace. And you know, all of the federal environmental laws that we have in this country, the 28 laws that we passed after Earth Day 1970, are all designed to, to restore free market capitalism in our country by forcing actors in the marketplace to pay the true cost of bringing their product to market. What we do as river keepers is, you know, we go out and sue polluters who have broken the law. And you know, we're not, we, we don't even consider ourselves environmentalists anymore. We're free marketeers. We go out and, and do, do, you know, ensure the integrity of free market capitalism in this country by forcing actors in the marketplace to pay the true cost of bringing their product to market. And when we go out in the marketplace, we catch the cheaters, the polluters, we say to them, we're going to force you to internalize your costs the same way that you internalize your profits. Because as long as somebody's cheating the free market, it distorts the whole marketplace. And none of us gets the advantages of the efficiency, the prosperity, and the democracy that free market capitalism otherwise promises our country. And what we have to understand in America, and more and more people are understanding it because of the, the shenanigans on Wall Street, the collapse there, is that there's a huge difference between free market capitalism, which makes the nation more efficient, more prosperous, and more democratic, and the kind of corporate crony capitalism, which we've embraced in this country so much, so widely, which is as antithetical to efficiency, prosperity, and democracy in America as it is in Nigeria. Now, I want to say one, make one last point, and it's the point that I actually intended to start off with um, <laughs> before this whole speech turned into a digression. <laughs> which is this. Now, we're not protecting the environment for the sake of the fishes and the birds. We're protecting it for our own sake. Because we recognize that nature enriches us. It enriches us economically, yes. It's the base of our economy, and we ignore that at our peril. The economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. But it also enriches us aesthetically and recreation and culturally and historically and spiritually. And human beings have other appetites besides money. And if we don't feed those appetites, we're not going to grow up. We're not going to become the kind of beings that our creator intended us to become. When we destroy nature, we diminish ourselves. We impoverish our children. We're not protecting those ancient forests in the Pacific Northwest, as Rush Limbaugh loves to say, for the sake of a spotted owl. We're preserving those forests because we believe the trees have more value to humanity standing than they would have if we cut them down. And I'm not fighting for the Hudson River for the sake of the shadow, the surge, and the striped bass, but because I believe my life will be richer, my community, my children will be richer if we live in a world where there are shad and sturgeon and stripers in the Hudson. And when my children can stand on the banks of the river and look out and see the small commercial fishermen, we have on the Hudson the oldest commercial fishery in North America. It's 350 years old. Many of the people I represent come from families that have been fishing the river continuously since such colonial times. It's traditional gear fishery. They use the same methods that were taught by the Algonquins to the original Dutch settlers in New Amsterdam and then passed down to the generations. The same is true on the Delaware. And I want my kids to see you know, these men and women in their tiny open boats with their ash poles and gill nets and touch them when they come to shore, or wade out the tides, repair the nets, and in doing that, connect themselves to 350 years of New York State history and understand that they're part of something larger than themselves. They're part of a continuum. They're part of a community. I don't want my kids to grow up in a world where there are no commercial fishermen on the Hudson, where it's all Gordon seafood and Unilever in 400-ton factory trawlers 100 miles offshore, strip mining the ocean, sucking down the federal subsidies that make everything that they do economic and that are not available to the little guys on the river, and, you know, and, and strip mining the ocean with no interface with humanity or with our communities. And I don't want my kids to grow up in a world where there are no family farmers left in Pennsylvania, where it's all Smithfield and Cargill and premium standard farms raising animals in factories and warehouses and treating their stock and their neighbors and their workers with unspeakable cruelty and, you know, again, completely dependent on subsidies, dumping their waste in the environment, poisoning our rivers and streams, and, you know, and, and driving the small and much more efficient farmers off. Swiftfield food cannot produce a pound of bacon or a pork chop cheaper or more efficiently than a traditional family farmer without breaking the law. It is a criminal enterprise. Its business plan is designed 
who allow it to break the law and get away with it. And if it can't do that, it cannot compete in the marketplace. It maintains its market control, not through greater efficiencies or economies of scale, but through ruthless market control and through huge federal subsidies and through also the sub externalized costs of dumping their stuff into the environment. Otherwise, they could not compete. But with those advantages, they're able to drive the small farmer off the land and empty the land and turn it over to corporations. And they're driving the final nail into the coffin of Thomas Jefferson's vision of an American democracy rooted in tens of thousands of independent freeholds owned by family farmers, each with a stake in our system of government. And I don't want my kids to grow up in a world where there are no, where we've paved the landscape and lost touch with the seasons and the tides and the things that connect us to the 10,000 generations of human beings that were here before there were laptops. And that, you know, and, and, to, and, to, and, and the things that connect us to, to, to God. And I don't believe that nature is God, or that we ought to be worshiping it as God. I do believe, and this is what St. Francis believes, that Father Ellis was talking about, that you know, it's the way that God communicates to us most forcefully. That um, you know, we don't know Michelangelo by reading his biography. We know him by looking at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And we know our Creator best by immersing ourselves in creation, and particularly wilderness, which is the undiluted work of the Creator. And you know, um, if you look at every religious tradition throughout the history of mankind, the central epiphany always occurs in the wilderness. Buddha had to go to the wilderness to experience nirvana and self-realization. Muhammad had to go to the wilderness of Mount Hera in 609, climb to the sun on a camping trip with his family in the middle of the night and wrestle the angel Gabriel there to have the Quran squeeze from him. Moses had to go to the wilderness of Mount Sinai for 40 days alone to get the commandments. The Jews had to spend 40 years wandering the wilderness to purge themselves of the 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Christ had to go to the wilderness for 40 days alone to discover his divinity for the first time. His mentor was John the Baptist, who lived in a cave in the Jordan Valley and dressed in the skins of wild beasts and ate locusts and, and honey. And all of Christ's parables were taken from nature. I am the vine, you are the branches, the mustard seed, the little swallows, the scattering the seeds in the fallow ground, the lilies in the field. He called himself a fisherman, a farmer, a vineyard keeper, a shepherd, all evincing his connection to his deep connection to nature. And the reason he did that, and it's the same reason all the Old Testament prophets, the Talmudic prophets, the Quranic prophets, the Upanishad prophets, all the way back to the pagan prophets like Esau, all of them came out of the wilderness, and all of them used parables and allegories and fables drawn from nature as morality plays to teach us the difference between right and wrong and what the face of God looks like. And the reason they did that is that's how they stayed in touch with the people. Because all of these prophets, like Christ, were revolutionaries. And one of Christ's central missions was to, to challenge the, the, the established religious hierarchy and fundamentalist hierarchy of his day. He was constantly rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, who were the Jerry Falwells and Pat Robertsons of his day, for binding up heavy burdens for other men to carry, and for impoverishing widows and orphans to aggrandize themselves. And he, was, he said to his own followers, you don't have to pay attention to all these rules and regulations that they try to put on you. And he said, you know, he said, the law was made for man. Man was not made for the law. And he told his followers, you can ignore these prescriptions about the Sabbath, about not working on the Sabbath, about what you can eat, what you can't eat. He said, it's not what you put in your body that makes you unclean. It's the way you conduct your lives, whether you conduct them with generosity and kindness and, and tolerance and patience, and, and whether you fight for justice and embrace poverty and the poor, and whether you love your neighbor and your enemy as if you were yourself. And that's the point of religion and religious beliefs. And, you know, it's not the only rules and regulations. It's, it's something more important than that. And, um, and he said, you know, and, and, and this, is what, this was earth-shaking to the establishment of his time. And worst of all, he said, you know, this was at a time when everybody believed that a big accumulations of wealth were a reflection of God's love and approval. So that if you were a wealthy man, it meant that God loved you more, and you were a good man. And Christ said, no, just the opposite. He said, the poor will inherit the earth. And he said, it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And that all of your pretensions and your wealth are actually a sign that you've done something wrong. And, and this, you know, and they killed him for this. And they nailed him to a tree. 
And, you know, but the people believed him because they were able, even though what, what he was saying contradicted everything they had heard from the literate, sophisticated people of their time, they were able to confirm the wisdom of his parables through their own observations of the fishes and the birds. And they were able to say, he's not telling us something new. He's simply illuminating something very, very old messages that were written into creation by the Creator at the beginning of time. And we haven't been able to discern or decipher them until the prophets came along, who had immersed themselves in wilderness and learned its language and come back to the cities to teach us the wisdom of God. You know, this is where our values come from, the overarching values that unite the entire human community from our unified experience in nature. And, um, and you know, in our country, our values are so rooted in nature. From the beginning of our national history, our greatest political leaders and cultural leaders were telling the American people, you don't have to be ashamed that you don't have the 1,500 years of culture that they have in Europe. Because you have this relationship to the land, and that's going to be the source of your values, your virtues, your character. Frederick Jackson Turner, who was our greatest American historian, said that in America, democracy came out of the forest. Without these vast tracts of wilderness and woodland, we wouldn't have evolved the political structure and institutions that define us as a people. And if you look at every valid piece of classic American literature and art and poetry, the unifying theme is that nature is the critical defining element of American culture. This is where our values come from. And you know, I, I saw, I, you know, the, I, the last couple of the eight years, you know, were so frustrating for me because we had an administration that was saying, presenting itself to a gullible press and to the American public as, as an administration of values. And at the same time, destroying the, you know, the blast of our wilderness, turning them over to the most venal powers in our society, the things that symbolize where all of our best values are rooted. And it wasn't an accident that at the same time, the rest of our values were also being flushed down the drain. You know, we're torturing people and eavesdropping on our citizens and you know, operating these black prisons and doing all of this stuff. And I'll just tell you one last story, which is that when I went, was a little boy, my father took me on a trip to Europe, and we went to Czechoslovakia and Poland and Germany, and uh, Italy and France and Greece and England. And everywhere we went, we were met by vast crowds of people, by hundreds of thousands of people, who came out on the streets because they wanted to be near an American politician. And it wasn't just because my father's brother had been martyred, you know, three years before, because the same thing happened to Eisenhower when he went to Kabul and Tehran. A million Muslim people met him at the airport and lined every street waving tiny little American flags. And I remember just the look in the faces of these vast crowds of people when I was a kid. It, they, they were starved for American leadership. And they knew the difference between leadership and bullying. And they were, they were hungry for our moral authority. They proudly named their streets after our presidents, Washington, Jefferson, and Madison. Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Kennedy. And I remember the day after 9-11 when the headline on the biggest newspaper in France, Le Mans, was we're all Americans now. And for three weeks after 9-11, tens of thousands of Muslim people came out onto the streets of Tehran to have spontaneous candlelight vigils to show their solidarity, their sympathy, their support, their love for the United States of America. We were the most beloved nation on earth in the history of the globe. And it took 230 years of discipline, restraint, and visionary leadership by Republican and Democratic presidents to build up those vast reservoirs of love for our country. And in eight short years, through monumental incompetence and arrogance, we drained those reservoirs dry. And that, to me, was the bitterest pill to swallow. Because I saw in the faces of those vast crowds of people when I was a boy the hope for leadership from our country, not just to do good things for America, but to do great things for all of humanity. And you know, Abraham Lincoln said that America is a great nation because we are a good nation. And he said, if we ever stop being a good nation, we'll quickly forfeit our greatness as well. And you know, over the last couple of years, we've done things, you know, the torturing and all this stuff, and people say, well, we had this debate going on in Washington now. We had to do it because, you know, we got freaked out by 9-11. We've never been under such, you know, a terrible threat before. Well, guess what? When I was a boy, we were under a much greater threat. You know, we were digging bomb shelters and doing duck and cover drills. We had 25,000 nuclear-tipped missiles pointing at our country 
with one guy able to push a button and each one capable of vaporizing an entire city. You know, and we weren't torturing people and eavesdropping on thousands of citizens and, you know, operating black prisons. We were pissed off at, at Castro for operating black, you know, prisons in, in Cuba and, you know, and mistreating prisoners in Cuba. And we thought he was a barbarian. And, you know, here we are, and as it turns out, you must have read this week, the torture methods that we were using were methods that were taken from the Chinese who used them against Americans during the Korean War. They devised them, and we thought they were barbarians. That's one of the things we said about China, is that they torture people. We don't do that in this country. And, you know, during the Revolutionary War, George Washington was asked, about torturing a group of British officers who had strategic information at a time when the British were torturing and killing American soldiers by the hundreds in New York Harbor on these prison ships. And Washington said, was so offended by this idea, he said, I would rather um, uh, lose this war and live back under the tyranny of, Eng of England than, um, than to bring such great shame upon our people and our cause. And he established rules for the fair treatment of, of POWs that were so stringent and so good that the Hessians that he captured on, on Christmas Day, after three weeks in American captivity, were so surprised by the good treatment they received at the hands of American soldiers that they agreed to walk unguarded the POW camps in Western Pennsylvania. Not a single one escaped. And most of them stayed here after the war ended. And, um, and the, the, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was asked about torturing Confederate soldiers. And he, again, was totally offended by the idea. And he ordered the creation of a commission to establish rules for the fair treatment of and humane treatment of prisoners of war. And that document, eight years later, became the Geneva Convention. That's our legacy to humanity, that we don't torture people. And during World War II, when the Nazis were torturing everybody they could get their hands on, Eisenhower was asked about torturing Germans. And he said, absolutely not. We're going to give them the best treatment that they can possibly get. And during World War II, Germans surrendered, German soldiers surrendered to American soldiers by the thousands because they had been told by their fathers who fought in World War I, always surrender to an American. Because Americans don't torture people. And this is who, part of our legacy and who we were. I had John Dean on my radio show the other day, who was President Nixon's counsel. And he said to me, and he's a Republican, and still, and he said, he said um, to me, you know, I went to jail after Watergate for four and a half months because we bugged illegally one building. And he said, my boss was impeached and forced to resign. And he said, these people have bugged hundreds of thousands of people, journalists, Congress people. You know, illegally, people who have nothing to do with terror. And he said, where are the indictments? Where is the impeachment? Where is the indignation? Where is the outrage? Where is the American press? And, you know, we have to ask ourselves, the country, we have, you know, we have to, we, right now, you know, we, we went through a period where we abandoned these values, our commitment to the environment, and they're all intertwined, and they, and we need to recommit ourselves to those values, and they start with this commitment to sustainability, which is just a commitment to humanity, and to make ourselves, America, an exemplary nation once again, which we have always been throughout our history. And it starts by taking responsibility for our communities and the environment for sustainability and renewing our commitment to those future generations who you know, will judge us um, uh, uh, morally based upon the choices, the selfish choices, that we're often making today. And so I want to thank uh, Villanova and I want to thank all of, the, all of you for this conference and for coming together here to figure out ways to redirect our nation towards a, 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 on a path that is sustainable and that takes us once again back to the moral high ground. So well, thank you very much. I don't think he's using those, that phrase anymore, but unfortunately, the coal industry um, got him saying that at one point, and, he, uh, and they're playing it uh, at great expense on advertisements every 10 minutes.
So, uh, but I, I don't think, I doubt if you will hear him saying that phrase again. But, you know, there, there's still, there's a lot of people who believe, and he may believe that there's a possibility of making green coal. And until you fly over Appalachia, or see them, you know, they're other damage. What they really mean when they mean clean coal is that they're going to sequester the carbon. But there's still all these other, you know, it's like Al Gore said the other day, that, you know, clean coal is like healthy cigarettes. It just, it doesn't exist. Yes? Um, you were talking about the The old batteries in Israel? Well, the utility owns the batteries. And so, you know, they're, um, and they, they're, they have strict um, standards for, um, for recycling. Those are lithium ion batteries, for recycling the lithium, which still has a, um, a value. But that, you know, that's a good question because well, the, the battery technologies, car battery technologies are, are uh, most of it is pretty bad, bad stuff. Yeah. This is the first time that I've heard, I believe you said that the Obama administration's uh, goal is to wean us off the floor by the end of the second term. That's what all of the representatives of, um, that were with me on that day have um, adopted that, endorsed that commitment, to try to get off of foreign oil within eight years. And I don't know if they mean Canadian oil is foreign oil, or they think Canada is part of the United States. <laughs> but um, but the, I think, and that is a very, very achievable goal. To get off of, if you if you don't include the Canadian oil, if you just include the you know the oil that we're getting from uh, Venezuela, Nigeria, the Persian Gulf, um, and uh, uh, Iraq. Um, and those are the, and Mexico. Those. Is there a real plan in place to do that now? Well, the plan, it, it, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, there is. That's what the energy plan is. The energy plan is, you know, which has efficiency standards for appliances, for automobiles, for houses. Those are the fa that's the fastest, and those megawatts are the fastest way to wean us. But also, they're building a national grid. You know, we're going to build a national grid. Well, I, you know, I, one of the things I told the students today, I, you know, I'm involved with all these companies at you know, the Green Tech, and my firm alone has created more jobs in this country over the past two years than all of the uh, Fortune 500 put together. You know, we're creating the, the big jobs that are being created now are being created in the green tech industry. And there are going to be jobs at every level. And, you know, what we're doing essentially is, you know, first of all, they're going to be at, at, on the blue collar level, we're going to be what the energy plan, the stimulus package combined, um, are going to create an industry for people to go around and pressure test every home in America and then blow insulation into them. And, you know, teams of people who go on a truck test your home and blow the insulation and, and just doing that will net us, you know, will net us uh, millions and millions of barrels of oil, the equivalent of millions of barrels of oil a year, but it will create about six million jobs to seal up the windows, um, to build turbines and erect them for the, uh, for the, uh, for our wind energy, the pylons to, to, to install um, photovoltaics on millions of homes, uh, to build solar thermal plants in the desert. We're creating and to you know create the energy and storage capacity that will allow us to intelligently store and deploy solar energy at night, wind energy during the doldrums. All of these things are going to create millions of jobs immediately in this country, um, and over the long term, a growing number of jobs. But not only that, you know, it's the the, the manufacturing job. If you envision that that during the, um, the Great Depression, and this is a depressing statistic actually, in in October of 1929. The stock market was at 396 before it crashed. In 1942, the stock market was at 86. Okay? So 13 years later, the depression was still in full bore. And what finally solved the depression 
was the huge industrial mobilization that, that, um, that Roosevelt commissioned in 1940, launched in 1941, that put every American back to work building our war machine. Well, the, the, the things they were building, the planes and the tanks and the trucks and the troop carriers and the amphibious vehicle, all of that stuff was shipped over to Europe and blown up. So we created wealth here by making things. But the things we were making were really stranded assets that didn't add anything themselves to the wealth of our country. But this industrial mobilization, not only will we create millions of jobs immediately building the pylons, the turbines, the farms, but those things, after they're constructed, will continue to generate wealth for our country for 100 years. And so it's a real investment, you know, and everybody says, well, what's the plan? What's the plan? Well, that's the plan. The plan is, you know, to create immediate jobs by building this infrastructure. And then once you build that infrastructure and the cost of energy drops to nothing, private enterprise is going to take over because their costs are going to be dramatically reduced and we're going to be a much more competitive nation. And, you know, so that's the plan and it's a good plan. Well, I'm all for nuclear if they can ever make it safe or um, or cost efficient. Right now, it, it just it's the it's the most co costly way ever devised to boil a pot of water. You know, they they promised it was going to be too cheap to meter, but you know the whole industry is based upon these absurd externalities. I mean, you know, we, who who pays for storing this stuff? for the next 30,000 years, which is five times the length of recorded human history. I mean, this is just classic deficit spending. You know, we're living off this energy now, so our children are gonna pay for it. Not, you know, not just our children, but you know, we're Im impoverishing generations of, of uh, I, I, we're impoverished. That's as long as humanity has been on the planet, right? 30,000 years. So, you know, how can you do that? And, and, then, and then pretend that what you're doing is, you know, is sensible. It's insane, really. And that's not the only subsidy. But, I mean, one of the subsidies is the Price-Anderson Act, where they, you know, um, you, the, the energy, the, the nuke industry doesn't have to pay insurance, right? Now, why don't they have to pay insurance? And this is interesting, because if you get advocates of nuclear energy, They'll say, you know, the guys, they'll come to you and they'll be very avuncular and sober and, you know, they all look like a, you know, a television doctor you want to believe in and stuff. They'll say, and they'll look sensible and they're lying to you. And they'll say, um, they'll say, you know, there hasn't been accidents in Three Mile Island. You know, we have a total great safety record, which is a bunch of baloney. I live next to a nuclear power plant and it's got an atrocious one. But they say this anyway. Nobody's ever been hurt, uh, you know, and we have a different kind than they have in Chernobyl. Okay, so my, my qu question to them is always the same. If you're so safe, how come you can't get insurance, right? The insurance industry won't write you a policy. And this isn't just like a bunch of hippies who are saying you're unsafe. It's guys with black ties and white shirts or, you know, with a pencil behind their ear and these little pencil packs in their pocket. <laughs> and, they're, and they're saying that you are too dangerous to insure. So you would go to Congress in the, you know, and have a sleazy legislative maneuver in the middle of the night and pass the Price-Anderson Act, which absolves them of all the risk of, of a nuclear accident or power plant. Okay, so if you, any of you are, are a homeowner, you go home and look at your homeowner's insurance policy. Every policy in this country has a provision in it saying that this policy does not insure you against um, radiation contamination of your home because of an accident in a nuclear power plant. Um, and what other industry has that? They've shifted their entire burden of risk to the American public, and then they're saying there is no risk. Well, if there's no risk, why don't they get insurance? The insurance industry is the final arbiter of risk in a capitalist system. And they all say they love capitalism. So, okay, let's live by the rules of capitalism. If you want to operate an industry, get insurance like everybody else. The problem is the insurance cost to them would be so astronomically high they couldn't afford to operate their plants. So, you know, it's not, like I said, it's not me who's saying this. It's the insurance industry who's saying it. And what I say to them when, you know, when they talk to me is, I'm all for you. 
just the intellectual costs, don't make my great, 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 great grandchildren pay for your cost of production, because that's immoral. You know, you pay for your disposal of your own stuff. And and get rid of the price Anderson Act and pay your own insurance. If you can pay your way, then you can compete in our marketplace. But don't expect public welfare, you know, from the rest of us so that you can operate, you know, play with your dirty, filthy toys in our neighborhoods, right? Well, we have a war, and a war is an oil war. Right? I mean, the, I, I, you know, President Bush did try to say, oh, this isn't about oil. But his father, when he, we went to the first Gulf War, his father was questioned, you know, why are we going to the Gulf, sending American soldiers to, to die in the Gulf? And he said, because of the oil. And that was called the Bush Doctrine. OK, now look it up. He said. We have a right, the Bush Doctrine is, and he said, I'm calling this the Bush Doctrine, and it is the, the proposition that we have a right to go to the Mideast to protect our oil lines because it is a vital resource for our country. And if, if there's a threat to the oil lines, we have a right to send troops over there. So then, um, it, it, then we signed a treaty, the Saddam Hussein, and Saddam Hussein violated that treaty, it was part, was the part of the settlement of that war, so we went to the second Gulf War, and then to say that the second Gulf War wasn't about oil, you know, this is about it's a it's an oil war, and it's and we're in it, it you know, a, a war, just like in World War II, we had oil rationing in this country because it was that was regarded as part of the um, part of the uh, uh, of the war effort that we all had to sacrifice to do oil rationing, oil rationing. But this war is much more about oil than the Second World War, and you know we should be like dealing with that issue right now. Instead, we're sending money to the guys, you know, who bombed us. Was uh, 17 of the 19 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. And, you know, they're paid for by uh, you know, the oil money we now know. They went to the modern schools and to, you know, the, all, all the, you know, to, to, to fund them. So why are we doing that? We shouldn't be doing that. It clearly is not to our interest. And it's not in Saudi Arabia's interest either, because you, there's a direct correlation between the wealth of oil and the the, the, the the tyranny of these systems. The more oil that they get, the higher the price of oil, the more tyrannical they become. And you know, that's very well documented. Thank you very much. Thank you.